The focus of today's session is to move beyond the basic von Neumann architecture and interrupt and start looking at the deeper relationship between assembly language and machine code. We're going to be looking at the different stages of assembly process, especially when we use things like two-pass assemblers. We're going to apply the two-pass assembler process to a given simple assembly language program. The reason we want to look at assembly language is because hardware on its own doesn't do much. It's the combination with the instruction set that's coded into the CPU itself. This allows us to create those wonderful sequences of instructions that allow us to make the programs that we use today. So we're going to be looking at simple assembly language programs, how to trace them, and you're going to be looking at sets of instructions which are based on the movement of data, input and output of data itself, arithmetic operations, perhaps unconditional and conditional instructions, and compare instructions. Finally, you'll be able to show an understanding of the different modes of addressing. So what's the difference between relative and indexed addressing, and so on. Now, as usual, before we begin, we need to understand some of the basic key terms that are going to be coming up in this particular lesson. Machine code, you should already know from IGCSE, it's the programming language that the CPU uses, normally binary. Instructions are single operations performed by a CPU. Assembly language is a low-level chip or machine-specific programming language that uses often mnemonics like ADD, STO, and so forth. Each instruction has two forms. You have an opcode, which is a short operational code like ADD. And then you have the operand, which is part of the machine code instruction that identifies the data that that instruction or that code, the opcode, needs to act upon. Then you've got the source code, assembler, instruction set, which is the complete set of machine codes, and then the object code. So the source code is before translation and the object code is after translation. So make sure that you pause the video and jot these down and do get back to me if there's something that you don't understand. Now let's go back in history and try to understand how developments in assembly language and instruction sets came about. We'll set the scene in MIT in 1959. So the story starts in the spring of 1959 when MIT offers a new course called Programming taught by John McCarthy. Now McCarthy has recently established a controversial new field of study, naming it artificial intelligence, and caused a stir by programming MIT's million-dollar IBM 704 mainframe to play chess. Now, with around 18 kilobytes of RAM and able to perform 12,000 calculations per second, this VAL-based 704 is impressive, but working with it is frustrating because programs are still loaded from punch card and processed in batch from start to finish. So output appears on the printer if all goes well, while if you've got any bugs, you've got to start all over again. Now this makes working with the 704 very slow and tedious, but things are about to change. And MIT's military research department donates a $3 million TX0 to McCarthy's faculty. So say, here you go, the TXO, as it's called, has less memory than the 704, but it's got several huge advantages, namely transistors. It's also got a display, a speaker, and a new typewriter-like input device, Flexo Writer. Now, thanks to these new developments, the new machine can execute 100,000 calculations per second. But more importantly to Samson, a hacker can sit at the terminal, and hackers aren't like the evil hackers. Hackers were trying to do things differently than what is normal. So at MIT, there was the whole concept of hacking, where it actually meant that if a machine or a program was designed to do something, can you get it to do something else? Can you hack the system to do something different? Now, the speaker in this machine is designed not as an output device, but to assist the operator. It simply clicks to indicate the contents of something called the 14th bit of the accumulator. So if it stops clicking, that means the program has finished. Or if you're unlucky, it's entered an infinite loop. But Samson sees a way to exploit this feature to make music. A simple program feeding the accumulator with the right sequence of data will cause the speaker bit to turn on and off at the correct frequency to play a note. Of course, it's going to be a simple square wave note. But if you put lots of these 
numbers through the registers in the right sequence and you have a little tune. So Samson actually teaches the Tixo to play classical music in just 4K of memory and the hackers of MIT are super impressed by this. So that was the first musical program written on a computer. So a computer plays Bach, the programmer Peter Sampson is pleased with the result and is now working on a general purpose music decoder that will read in codes from paper tape and plays corresponding notes on the computer speaker. Now all of this was coded using assembly language and the instruction set which is built into a computer's CPU. Now Samson was one of the early pioneers and on screen you can see him and Edwards, another hacker, playing Spacewalk, one of the first video games in 1962, which was also coded using assembly language. Now on screen you'll see how the assembly line process works. So an assembly code instruction is written using short keywords called mnemonics and they are things like INP, STA, ADD, OUT and some of these actually make logical sense. Each instruction contains two parts, an opcode and an operand. The opcode is what you want the instruction to do, the task itself, and the operand is what you want to operate on, the data. And assembly code normally gives one-to-one -one mapping from opcode to binary. If you consider this Python statement that you see on screen, print first number plus second number, there are multiple instructions present, load, add, store, output in the same line of code. And that doesn't happen in assembly code. Everything is done one step at a time, which is closer to how the CPU executes instructions. Now, one of the books I would really recommend for you to read is Stephen Levy's Hackers. And this quote, which I'm just going to leave on screen for you to read in your own time, kind of gives you the mindset of how people in the 50s and 60s were operating using computers. And chances are that you probably experienced the same as well. The moment that you get a computer to do something that it hasn't done before, in your experience, it is magical. And that's sometimes you're in the zone as programmers speak when you're programming or you're coding and minutes becomes hour becomes days in some cases and that's basically what programmers strive for to be able to get a machine to do things which weren't possible before programmers do not usually write machine codes these days because it's very difficult to understand and it can be quite complicated to manage especially the data manipulation and storage side of things so the following snippet of program that you see on screen adds two numbers together and it's written in typical machine code and is shown in both hexadecimal and binary form and consists of three statements. Now if you just encountered this program and you don't know what the hexadecimal or the binary code is equivalent of, it doesn't make any sense to you. It's not easy to understand at all. Whether it's in hexadecimal or whether it's in pure binary both are equally difficult and that's why low-level assembly language and then high-level languages like Python were created to make it easier for more people to control computers. Since the purpose of this lesson is all about assembly, assembly is perhaps the first programming language. It uses mnemonics and you can see some on screen and three different sets of instructions, the machine code, the binary and the assembly language. Now the way it's structured, you should be able to identify the opcode and operand in all three of them. Having that context of what that assembly language mnemonic means makes it much easier for you to recognize the code in hexadecimal and perhaps in machine code or binary. Hopefully you've Pause the video and had a look at this, and you can identify the opcode and operand. So LDD is the opcode, total is the operand, and in hexadecimal it's 0, 1, and 4, 0. And in binary, you can work out the equivalent number of bits and split the machine code to identify the first part, which is the opcode, and the second part, which is the operand.
Now it makes sense that once you have a language, even a low level language like assembly language, those words like LDD need to be translated into machine code. And for that, you need a translator, which is called an assembler, to convert the original source code into the machine code or the object code. The compiled machine code is specific to each machine as it uses the relevant instruction set of the CPU. So the assembly language program that has been created for one particular computer will not always work on another computer unless they are of the same type. Now the assembler checks the syntax of the assembly language program. It ensures that everything is translated one to one in the correct machine code and this helps speed up development time as some errors are identified during the translation before the program is executed. Now imagine if you coded in machine code and you made a mistake, the CPU would actually run the program and crash. Whereas when you are coding in assembly language, you do a bit of syntax checking and you identify the mistakes before the program is actually executed. Now there are different types of assemblers. You have single pass assemblers and you also have two pass assemblers. A single pass assembler puts the machine code instructions straight into the computer's memory to be executed. A two pass assembler will first produce an object program in machine code that can be stored, loaded and then executed at a later stage. So this translated code would then require another program called a loader at a later stage. Because you've saved it, then you will need to load it. You're not going to assemble it again because it's already been assembled and saved. Two pass assemblers need to scan the source program twice so they can replace labels in the assembly program with memory addresses in the machine code program. For example, you might simply say add first, add second, and the first one is linked to memory address 00001 and the other one is 00010. So the use of labels allow ease of use for the programmer, but it's very difficult for machine code instructions to be executed because computers do not understand labels, they understand actual addresses in binary. So do pause the video and do go through the diagram that you see on screen and how labels are actually changed into memory addresses. So let's delve a bit more deeper into the two pass assembler and look at what happens at each pass. So in pass one, you read the assembly language program one line at a time. The assembler ignores anything which is not required, such as common statements. It allocates a memory address for the line of code. It checks the opcode is in the instruction set and you haven't put something completely different. It adds any new labels to the symbol table with the address if known, and it places addresses of labeled instructions in the symbol table. So we're going to be looking at the symbol table in a bit more detail in a moment. So at the second pass, it then reads the assembly language program one line at a time again. And it now generates the object code, including opcode and operand, from the symbol table generated in pass one. It then saves or it executes the program, depending on what the demand is. Now, why do we need a second pass? Especially if you're using labels, have a look at this particular assembly code program. It's got two labels, it's got some instructions, opcodes, and it's got some operands. So it's loading something at address 200 perhaps, it's comparing it to whatever stored at address 0, and then it's either jumping based on a condition to found or not found. Now, can you think of a reason why? Hopefully you worked it out. The second pass is required as some labels may be referred to before their address is known. Found is a forward reference for the JPN instruction. Now humans read the entire program, but imagine a computer reading it line by line. When it gets to the JPN and it has to operate on found, it doesn't know where found is because it hasn't read the rest of the program. So the first part requires it to read the whole program and create this symbol table. And the second part requires it to translate it into the actual machine code instructions, which can be saved or executed. So let's look at the different types of assembly language instructions. You don't need to memorize these because in the exam you'll be given this as part of the question. 
The first set of instructions we're going to be looking at are called data movement instructions. And these instructions allow data stored at one location to be copied into the accumulator. This data can then be stored at another location, used in a calculation, used for a comparison, or simply output. Pause the video and go through the instruction set on the right hand side of the screen. You'll be able to see the common commands like LDM, which loads number into the accumulator. It uses a mode called immediate addressing, which we'll look at later. Then LDD, which loads the contents of a specific address into the accumulator using direct addressing. So the M and the D, you know, look at different modes of addressing. Then you've got LDI, then you've got LDX, LDR, and so forth. Now other commands are like the move command, the store command, and the end command. They're pretty self-explanatory. You can just read the explanation and any acronyms that are used in the description are also defined in the key below. In the exam, you'll be given this. You do not need to memorize them, but it's useful for you to know what they are and their uses in simple assembly language programs. And we're going to be looking at some of that later as well. Now, the next set of assembly language instructions you need to be familiar with are input and output of data instructions. These instructions allow data to be read from keyboard or output to a screen. Basic in and out, nothing complicated. Again, if you were ever to use that in an exam, you'll be given this. The next set of instruction types are arithmetic operation instructions, and these perform simple calculations on the data stored in the accumulator, and then the stored answer in the accumulator overwriting the previous data or the original data. Add obviously adds the contents of an address to the accumulator. Add hash n adds a deanery number, sub subtracts, inc increments, and de decreases. So, again, pretty straightforward. Do remember everything is done more or less on the accumulator or the index register, and we'll look at that later. The next set of instructions are conditional and unconditional instructions, and these instructions perform simple choices to branch up the code basically, if statements, so if then else, and so forth. Jump jumps to a specific address, JPE follows a compare instruction and jumps to a specific address if the comparison is true, JPN jumps to an address if the comparison is false, and end returns control to the operating system. Again, these instructions will be given to you, but do pause the video and get familiar with them so you know what these are. Remember, JMP and JPE, JPN are opcodes, and the operand is the address which this opcode will be executed on. The next set of instructions are compare instructions. We briefly talked about that previously. These instructions allow comparisons to be made. So CMP compares the contents of the accumulator with the contents of a specific address. And CMI, again, is another version of comparison which uses indirect addressing. Now, in all types of compare instructions, the contents of the accumulator are always compared. So again, pause the video, have a look. Sometimes with uh, compare instruction, you will have a jump instruction because after the comparison, if it's true or false, you then jump into different locations. So compare can be followed by a jump. So you will probably be able to identify patterns the more you start going through assembly language instructions. The final set of instructions that you need to be familiar with are logical instructions, and these use AND, XOR, OR, or left shift and right shifts. So you move the bits in the accumulator a couple of places to, towards the left or to the right. And that's the equivalent of basic multiplication or division. Now on screen, you can see this and how does it actually work. So think about this. Accumulator holds a 1 and hash 0 is passed. So this results in 0 because 1 and a 0 in a logic gate which has an AND logic gate. 1 and a 0 will give you an output of a 0. If it was AND hash 1, that means accumulator holds 1, and you're going to perform an AND operation with the number 1, 1 and 1 will give an output of a 1. So that's how you could use bitwise AND XOR OR. So you need to be familiar with those logic gates, and they can be used pretty easily with a CPU in their instruction set as well. Okay, hopefully you understood everything to do with assembly language instruction sets. We're now going to be looking at addressing modes, and some of these addressing modes are useful 
when opcodes need to work with data that's stored at different locations and these types of addressing modes allow us to get to different memory addresses a lot more quicker than the basic incrementing or decrementing. So do pause the video and drop these down. So addressing modes are just different methods of using the operand part of a machine code instruction, normally as a memory address. And then you've got absolute and direct addressing. Basically, they're the same thing in which the contents of the memory location in the operand are used. Of course, there's lots of different ways, indirect, indexed, immediate, relative, and symbolic. So hopefully jot these down and we're going to be looking at all of these in a bit more detail next. Okay, so start by looking at absolute and direct addressing. They're more or less the same thing. You've got an example or two on screen. So let's look at that. So if the memory location with the address 200 contains the value 20, the assembly language instruction LDD 200 would store 20 in the accumulator because it will go to that address 200 and whatever data is stored there goes into the accumulator. Direct works exactly the same way. So if you've got something like LDD 200 and at address 200 the value 20 is stored, that will go into the accumulator. So more or less the same thing. Next up is indirect addressing. So here the contents of the memory location in the operand are actually used. So if the memory location with address 200 contains the value 20 and the memory location with address 20 contains the value 5, the assembly language instruction LDI 200 would actually store 5 in the accumulator because first you'll go to 200 which points to the value 20 or which is the next address. You go to address 20 that contains 5 and that's what's loaded into the accumulator. So this is an example of indirect addressing. Index addressing on the other hand uses the index register. So if you've got an index register and it holds the value 4 in it and you've got an operation that says LDX 200 you would add the value 4 to the operand 200 so it gives you 204 and the value stored at that location is loaded instead of whatever the value at location 200. So in this case the address 204 contains the value 17 that's what's going to be loaded into the accumulator rather than the original value of 20 which is stored at address 200. Of course if the index register was 0 then you would just load whatever value was stored at 200 because 200 plus 0 is still 200. So the X part is used to specify index addressing and it uses the index register which is something that we talked about when we were looking at registers early on. Now next is immediate addressing and the, here the value of the operand is used. For example if you've got instruction LDM 200 normally it's preceded by a little hash so LDM hash 200 would store 200 in the accumulator because it says this is the actual data you don't need to go to any kind of addresses to fetch the data and then you've got relative addressing here the memory address used is the current memory address added to the operand an example of this is GMR hash 5 which would transfer control to the instruction five locations after the current instruction so if the current instruction is at address 200 GMR hash 5 would mean that you go to address 205 and get the data from there for the accumulator. Symbolic addressing is only used in assembly language programming and it basically uses a label instead of a value. So you can take a memory location with address 200 and you can label it my store and then you just need to simply say LDD my store and it knows that you need to go to my store label which is address 200 and take the value 20 from there and put that into the accumulator. Now the used labels make it easier to alter assembly language programs because when absolute addresses are used every reference to that address needs to be edited if an extra instruction is added. For example, here's a simple assembly language program. You've got three numbers, first, second and third and you add them up and store them in total. Now if instead of the labels we use actual addresses then you might have address 200 where the value 20 is stored, address 201 where 30 is stored and address 202 where stored and 203 is where you would store the final total. But what if you had to change these to 300, 301, 2, 3 and 4 or 500 or 10,000 or whatever for any particular reason. In the program you would then have to manually go and change every time this address is being listed. So in this particular program 
the one that's on the right hand side of the screen, you've got a label start which says load first. So that goes to wherever the label first is. It doesn't care if it's a 200 or 10,000. It just loads that value 20 into the accumulator. The second line simply says add the second to the value in the accumulator. So it goes to the label second and this, it could be 10,000 million, doesn't care. Brings 30 back, adds it, results is 50 stored in the accumulator. Similarly, you do that for the third one, add the third, you get 90, and then that is stored in the label total, and the total could be again 555 or 10 billion. And that allows us to just simply change the address location in one part, which is where the first, second, third, and total labels are referenced. We do not need to change it in any other part of the assembly language program if we're using labels. That helps speed up development and it also helps us ensure that programs are error free. So that works a lot more efficiently than simply using actual address modes in assembly language program. So you will probably see a simple table like the one that you see on screen. This is called a symbol table where you have labels and the addresses and this is where you would change that. So the start is at 100, the first is at 106, second 107, third 108, total 109 and if you change it to a new address this is where you will change it. In the exam you're probably going to be given symbol tables like this or you might be given a context question where you will need to populate a symbol table from whatever description they've given you but they are pretty straightforward. The headings will be given to you and all you're simply doing is putting the labels and the relevant correct addresses in the right place. Now the trace table that you see on screen is another way for you to trace assembly language programs and that's also going to be quite relevant. Often in the exam you get a question where you will be given an assembly language program, you'll be probably given the descriptions of what those opcodes mean and you will be asked to trace the table down. On screen you see an example of that particular type of trace table using the program we're looking at previously. So 100, load the first, Accumulator holds the value 20 and you will see that 106, 107, 108 and 109 initially will have the values 20, 30, 40 and 0. So when 101 is executed, you add the second, which means you take 30 and add it to the accumulator, which gives you 50. Everything else remains the same. 102 is add the third. You add the value 40 to it. The accumulator changes to 90. Everything else stays the same. The next line simply says store in total so you store the value which is held in the accumulator which is 90 into the total label address which is 109 and that's how you go about tracing a simple assembly language program now as programs become complicated so does the code the same task written in assembly language would require the use of an index register so for counter is equal to 1, 2, 3, total is equal to total plus number and the counter index and next counter. So pretty straightforward. Now if you can look at the assembly language, you can then see what's happening with the code. So do pause the video and study it in a bit of depth. Okay, so the program should have made sense. You're loading zero into the accumulator. You're storing this in the total label. You're then storing the counter. You then move on to setting up the index register and then you start your loop and follow the steps of adding, storing, incrementing, loading, incrementing, storing and then you keep on comparing and if it is greater than 3 then that's your exit condition and you exit loop otherwise you keep looping. And the labels and the addresses are all defined at the bottom. Now if the program is to be loaded at memory address 100 after translation and each memory location contains 16 bits the symbol table for that particular small section of the program would look like the one below and the trace table would be quite extensive now it was so big that you could probably just about make it how long it would take for you to trace it now in the exam you won't be given anything complex like this what they would expect you to do is at most is 10 to 12 steps. So they're going to be very, very simple, adding, incrementing, comparisons, and that's about it. Okay, you looked at a lot of theory and you listened a lot. Now's the time for you to actually do some practice. So do pause the video and have a go at some of these example questions, which build up on your knowledge of today and previous sessions related to computer architecture. So this particular question has a very nice and easy start. You store the value of the binary number after another five 
uh, cake tins have been filled. So you will need to add that to the number at the top and write it down, binary conversion, easy peasy stuff. The second part is when you start delving into assembly language. So that you've given the instructions, the op code and the operands, there's some explanation, and then a context is set and you're expected to write the assembly language statement to reset the register to zero. So you look at the register that you have just created, that binary set of digits, and then you use one of the bitwise combinations to get it to zero. So I'll leave that up to you. So here's another type of question where you get a different set of instructions given to you, same thing, opcode, operand, and explanation, and then an actual assembly language program. You've also got some data on the side which you need to use for this particular program. So do pause the video and study this and you might need to go backwards and forwards in the video because the actual question comes up next. Okay, so using that program and the data, you need to complete this particular trace table using the values that they've given you. Again, if you remember, at IGCSE level, you have to trace algorithms. This is no different. The algorithms are given to you in assembly language form, and all you need to do is decipher what they actually mean by reading the explanation, and then simply following it one step at a time. I find that these type of questions are a lot more easier to do compared to those flowchart and pseudocode trace table-like questions that you encounter at IGCSE. Okay, that's the end of the lesson for today. Hopefully by the end of this session, you know what assembly language is. You should be able to describe the two different types of assemblers. The first is the one pass assembler and the second is the two pass assembler. And for the two pass assembler, you should be able to explain how it actually works. You should also know what an assembly language program looks like, how to create simple ones, and you should be able to work out the output of an assembly language program. Do go through the questions and as usual, if there's anything you don't understand, do get back to me. Bye for now.